Hey guys, welcome back. BDC Care here. We're back with season 8, episode 16 of our weekly Q&A videos slash podcasts, which is to say if you're watching this on YouTube, you could also be listening to this in podcast format by checking out some of the links in the description on a bunch of different platforms. And if you are listening to this on a podcast in an audio only format, then you almost certainly already know about the YouTube channel uh, where you were most likely originally before you got directed to the the second place that you can find us. Right. So we've got a bit of a light question week this week. So this is our reminder to if you have questions for us, give us questions to answer so that we have this content. If you enjoy listening, uh, think up of something to ask us so that we can continue yeah. to make these videos for you and all the other people. And preferably more than just some factual question that's yes or no, or just saying, spouting off fact. What, what, I mean, what we're looking for are, are topics to that are takeoff points for a discussion. Things to engage with, yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyways... Well, last week was a heavier week because we had more things... And we ran out of time. And yeah. I actually meant to, if we can do that, to start off with a, maybe a question and also some something I wanted to comment about a book I was reading. So it's interesting. Mm-hmm. The reason why it's interesting is there's a writer. Her name is Susan Powick. She wrote this absolutely brilliant book. It was called, it was her first novel. It was called Flying in Place. It was about child abuse. It was incredibly uh, moving and disturbing and upsetting but it it was brilliantly written it's hard to to sort of really explain it because part of the reason um is that i I never went back to reread it most books that i really like that i think are really good i reread i just found it too upsetting to go back to it but i remember that i picked it up originally because she'd written some short stories that i'd found really memorable Mm. And so what's interesting, the reason why it's interesting, it's not about flying in place. It's that I've, since each of her other books came out, I've picked up a copy, Mm -hmm. never read them because I think part of it was, I was so, I had them. It was like traumatic. It it was a little bit traumatic. And I I don't think I can, I can't really think of any other books that have hit me like that. Yeah. So I finally got around to reading one of her later novels, Mending the Moon. Yeah. And it's not much of a spoiler when I say it's a book about the impact of a murder on both the murderer's family and the uh, victim's family. Mm. And it's, I guess it's nominally uh, a, not so much a science, I guess sort of science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction, not because there's actually any fantastic elements to it, but and the reason why I say that it is is because the editor is Patrick Nielsen Hayden, who is specifically an editor for Tor, yeah, and does a lot of does exclusively I feel like science fiction fantasy stuff. Is that there's a parallel story that's not even really, um, you know how sometimes it, so it's a, there's a, a parallel the, a comic book that plays a part in the story mm-hmm. as a comic book. But then there's elements of the story of the characters happening in the comic book story. So are these two separate pieces of media, or is there a comic book within the book? It's it's not a comic book within the book. Oh, sorry. It's the idea of a comic book in the book. There aren't any panels. There's no okay. illustrations or anything inside. But it talks about this particular comic book in their world yeah. that was created. They talk about the process of how it was created and where it's going and the story that's happening in the sto- in the comic book itself. Yeah. But it's not... There's nothing fantastical about it, because it's a comic book. Yeah. So you're so saying, doesn't bleed you're into saying the world. in fiction, there is a comic book that features prominently in the story, where there's a lot of details about the comic book, and that is sort of where the fantasy comes in, but it's it's a piece of media within the world of the book. Yeah. And I guess the closest that'll come to it is sort of al- alternative reality, where this is a comic book that doesn't exist in our world. Yeah. And that's the most tenuous links to being not just what what's I guess it's literary fiction. Yeah. Uh but it again it's very I don't I I found it very moving and there's something that she captures about grief that feels so real. I mean, I don't know that I've had the same kind of experiences as w- what the characters have had, mm-hmm. but there's something of when when a writer does it really well that they capture. It's like emotionally accessible. 
I, I don't want to say exactly that because I don't, yeah, it, it is that, but that's not the part that makes it so powerful. What's so powerful is that there's an experience there that I, I haven't been a party to, but now after just reading this book, I feel like I've had, I've been there a little bit, you know? Yeah, like you have, just, there's a certain amount of insight. Yeah, and there's, the way she writes about it, there's a, clearly, you know, like when people give you information yeah. or talk about stuff, and sometimes you can tell, but just by the way they're talking, it's a lot, a lot of BS. And sometimes the way they're talking about it, even if you don't really have a way of confirming the information, the way they explain it makes it feel very real, like they actually have expertise without you having an objective way to judge it. Yeah. Yeah. I The person that I feel of, um, that way a lot about, uh, John Darnielle of The Mountain Goats, mm -hmm. his writing in songs, I think, does a spectacular job of injecting a certain amount of... I don't want to say mundanity, because it's not, like, super mundane, but a certain amount of physicality in place, um, where you really do feel like, um, in the physical position of the narrator of the song, more uh. so than almost any other piece of media. Like, there's right. one song, uh, I forget its name, it's, like, Genesis 33, it's one of the ones from The Light of the World to Come, uh, which are all named after... Uh, Bible verses, so right. they they all have names that have absolutely no meaning to me. Oh, it's like remembering random numbers. Yeah, it okay. might be like one Samuel fifteen something or what. Okay. Like it, but the um he has it's and it's a song about grief. It's a song about losing somebody to cancer. Um, and a lot of the song is about like f like taking a plane over and then <laughs> driving up this specific highway and then. Um, like pulling into like the driveway of uh the the ca like care home or whatever location that she's receiving care in, right. um and like the the way that they talk about like um he's like I had only seen the name on envelopes I find the parking lot and turned right uh I felt all the details carving out space in my head Tropicana's on the walkway neon red and the way that he builds it into the song yeah that sort of physicality of like walking like point A to point B. And travel, and that's something that he does a lot. He has a whole set of songs that are like going to blank, um, and he has a whole album just named after Tallahassee. And it's like you know, there's a lot of like it's like a there's like road trips that happen across like albums or sets of songs and a bunch of stuff like that. And he does a really really good job of uh, giving all those details. And I think I don't think all of them they're not all autobiographical. He spends a lot of time writing stories about right. other people and inhabiting characters. Mm -hmm. Um, for the purposes of his song, but the way that he places stuff, the way that it feels like somebody's telling you about like a trip they took, right? right and right. The, it, it is that level of detail where you, it doesn't feel constructed. It feels very real. Like recounting something that happened as yeah. opposed to making it up. Yeah. Th there's one thing that a lot of really good writers do it is that they engage all your senses, right? Mm -hmm. They don't just tell you what people are saying, what you hear, what you see. Mm -hmm. They talk about what you smell. They talk about what you touch and feel. It's all of that. Mm -hmm. So th th that's actually perfect because to, I, I was trying to put into words what it was that Susan Powell does that I find so powerful mm -hmm. is that she puts, the same way you're describing, John Darnielle puts you in a place. Yeah. She puts me and it, when, I, when I read what she's written in an emotional place, and I, it's not as transparent to see how I got there, where it feels like there's that same kind of, I feel like I'm right there emotionally. Yeah. 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 They really use details to like center you in a specific type of he like mindset and headspace. Yeah. And that's why part of the reason why I find, found it so powerful, because it feels like there's this a real understanding of, of grief that she's able to... I don't really want to say articulate because she doesn't just lecture you about it, right? What she's doing is she's describing it and it just, um, it, I don't know. It just feels, is it, is it fair in saying there's, there's a, a real verisimilitude in it, right? Like it just feels so real mm -hmm. so that even if these particular characters don't exist, yeah. that they're drawn from real experiences to have that understanding of what's actually happening when mm -hmm. you're dealing with uh, death, when you're dealing with um, people who are close to you, who you realize you didn't know nearly as well as you thought you did. Mm. So, oh, and I and so I finished that. Uh, highly recommend it. So, Flying in Place, um, 
Mending the Moon, and now I'm re- going back to one of the the earlier novels, uh, Necessary Beggar. Okay. And the again, not a big spoiler. The conceit really is so a lot of fantasy novels you read. Yeah. What happens is you have people coming from our world, like when what are they called? They're called like um, is it second world fantasies? There's an expression for it where you go out of our world into another world where there's like a, a, a so hard another fantastic realm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what those are called, but I know the type of book that you're talking about. Right, so, oh, good example that's that, but a portal fantasy would be like Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe that a lot of people are familiar yeah. with. Yeah, so... Um, or almost like Harry Potter, right? Because he starts out, not right. for most of it, but from the start of it to right. transition into it. Right, um, so this does the opposite. It starts off from a place where people are coming in from the fantasy world, mm-hmm. and they're stuck in our world. Mm. And it's it's there's that same sort of fish out of water and and figuring stuff out and that sort of disjointed feeling where you're mm-hmm. not things are not quite right. Only the, the the cool thing is it's this world. Yeah. Uh Robert J. Sawyer did that with his um hominids. Was that what it was, was oh, called? I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he did a good job of that. And I the live action uh I don't know if it was Disney or if it was like a pastiche of Disney, but disenchanted. That movie also did that, where they had, like, a princess. Oh. Like, a, I think she might have literally been animated before she came through the portal. Oh, oh, oh uh, was it Disenchanted? It was um, the one with Amy Adams. Ella Enchanted, maybe, was also... No, it was one? Enchanted. It was Enchanted. It wasn't even Ella Enchanted. It was just Enchanted. Okay, yeah. But, there. so there's been... There's, those are the things that I... The other piece of media that I can yeah. bring to mind that do a similar thing. But that's fun. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting, because I think it's... It's almost a cliche, right? The other way around, where it's people get comfortable with it and rely on it. It's it's a little bit jarring, but not in a bad way. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm a bit of a slow reader, so it might take me a few weeks more to get through it. But I'm really enjoying it. I'm glad. I'm sad. I guess I, I'm not entirely sad because I'm getting a chance to read it now that I didn't, that I've been seeing all these books. But I'm glad I kept on picking them up so that when I'm mm-hmm. now that I'm in the right frame of mind, I... I have the opportunity to... <laughs> now that you've gotten the emotional distance. Yeah. No, seriously. Flying Place, like, it's... There's harrowing. I've seen people describe books as harrowing, and I saw one reviewer say it, and that's the perfect word. Yeah. It is really, like... It, it was really upsetting. Yeah. I don't know if it's the same level of upsetting. A book that I found kind of harrowing is The Kite Runner. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I never read that. That was a movie, right? They made that into They a made it into a movie. It's... It was just... There was a lot of stuff happening, and it was... it felt like varying levels of real it was one of those books that by the end of it it almost lost its impact because i felt like it was just so unrelenting um and that there was constantly just new things happening that was terrible like every chapter that there was like and i had to read it for school so i couldn't just like put it down like i didn't really have the space to give it time right um and so it was just like there was constantly new things happening that were just horrible uh, and then by the end of it, I was like, this almost feels contrived to make these characters experience misery. And like, but okay. So, and I know that Kite Runner is very popular. Yeah. And it was, was it critically well received? I believe, I don't know. Okay. I had to read it for school. So, so, you know, English teachers like it. So the, the idea of, I mean, part of me feels like that the, really the best stories, there's an ebb and a flow to it when they're that like the word you I think you were used was unrelenting yeah when they they push you that hard it almost it, it almost loses some of its impact right yeah because you it's if you're sort of immersed in it you become a little bit numb yeah to whatever horror or whatever intensity that you're the the the, the story is supposed to be yeah um building up in you i think it did have some ebb and flow i just think it might have also just been how fast i was reading it uh that i wasn't able to stop and it was just another thing this is a brief spoiler for the kite runner for the next like minute i don't know um if you care about the kite runner uh and reading it for the first time but there was just one thing where it's like a childhood bully and the childhood bully then comes back later as i don't remember exactly like so i'm not like a hundred a hundred percent sure but i'm pretty confident that it was like he was, like, now a member of, like, the terrorists, like, occupying, like, the the city that the main character returns to. Right. And they, like, they, and he, he just comes back in, like, right at the end, uh, which seems 
which seemed very strange to me. Like it, it seemed, it was one of those things where I'm like, I guess so, but it seems very contrived that like the person who was one of the sources of like consternation and suffering earlier is like coming back and around. And I like, that might've just been the fact that a lot of it didn't feel like they were doing that sort of like, um, fantastical story. Like it felt like it was supposed to be a lot more grounded where I get like, maybe it was part of like the emotional arc to have like the interaction with that character be resolved instead of them just being like a childhood bully earlier on. Right. But it felt a lot less real to me mm. than just having like, you know, you could have terrorism and having the place that you grew up and become a more dangerous place and right. have it transformed. And I, um, this was from the perspective of somebody who got out and immigrated to America. Right. right? And so for somebody to come back home and to have home not be a place for them anymore, and to have it be mm. dangerous, and to have it, uh, you know, to come at it from this blended perspective of both it being your home, but then also living in the West and understanding the ways that your culture and your home isn't understood or respected properly, right? And then seeing this, like, I think there's a lot of really sort of mostly re resonant stuff, right? Just to come back, and I don't think you need to make your childhood bully the Taliban guy, right? Uh, like, okay. and it, and... Uh, yeah. I think for how grounded a lot of it felt, that part really was another thing where it had been so much, right? And yeah. so sort of without space to breathe. And right. then the way that they brought that back and I'm like, are, I'm like, are you really, is this <laughs> like, is this how we're doing? Yeah. Like, cause it, it felt kind of real to just have a bully and have it be kind of terrible. Right. And then, you know, like a bully just sort of, you have them and then they leave and you don't, you don't get like closure right but it was yeah. weird to be like okay but now he's the terrorist guy and i'm like i like i i guess so <laughs> but it was yeah it, it does kind of take you out i and i'm not sure if it would have hit everybody the same way um and it i might be missing the point of what i was supposed to feel um for those that point in the story i can just tell you what i felt right um right. <laughs> at that point in it and this is also me you know talking um like three years down the line from it so right. I also don't remember all the details. I, I do remember that it was terrorism. I don't remember specific. I said Taliban, but I'm, I just threw that it, out. Is, so do you think if this is something that you might go back to and read again to see if coming back? Oh, to, I, oh, I don't it, know. Cause I didn't, the thing is that when I was out of it, I wasn't enjoying it. Cause I'm like, that's kind of a weird choice. And when I was mm. in it, I was like, oh, this is really sad. And so I wasn't really enjoying it either. You know, right, right. there wasn't like, I think it was well written um, and I think it's like a good piece of media overall. And again, like that's me removed from it where I couldn't tell you why. Right. And I couldn't tell you if I would feel that way reading it today. Right. Uh, but that was my impression of it. But I also didn't feel like there was any point of it where I was like really enjoying the experience of reading it uh, for one reason or the other. Yeah, that's... Uh, you know, some books like that, right? Like, yeah. I, I mean, you, you thought you said, wow, this is really well written. Uh, I'm never going to read this again, and I'm not well, going to read the other books but, by this but, author. But I never, I, I never actually, or uh, in my mind, I never thought of it like that. It was more just, I, I don't want to say I enjoyed it because it seems like such a the wrong word for it. Yeah. I found the experience very moving. Mm -hmm. I was glad to have read the book, and most of the time, when I can say that about a book. I want to go back to that experience again, right? Yeah. And I just, again, it was more just that I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself, there's just something about it. And I think now, now maybe that I've had that separation, now that I'm talking about it out loud, I might go back to, to try to see what it was yeah. that I, I found so powerful about my first experience reading that novel. That's true. It might actually be helpful for me to go back to the Kite Rudder when I can read it at my own pace. Yeah. and everything because it is an important book uh we we will get into questions in just a second but i think because we don't have as many questions we can make this stretch out a little bit there's one last piece of media now that we're talking about stuff where like we felt weird about it when we mm -hmm. first watched it mm -hmm. this is probably one of my favorite movies uh but it became my favorite movie like retroactively because i think when i first came to it i didn't know what to expect and I think I watched it in the way where I was like, oh, this is going to be sort of like an interesting, like, like popcorn movie. And it was not what I expected. Sorry to bother you. Oh, I really, I love that movie. Um, a lot. 
Did we watch that together? We did watch it together. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I love that movie a lot. And when I first finished watching it, I was like, there's definitely parts I enjoyed. There was, but it, it, it I was like, I f- walked away from that being like my, the main feeling I got, the main sense I got, I was like, that was so weird. And I'm like, and I'm not a hundred percent sure. Like I found that experience so strange that I, I, Positive or negative isn't really the valence that, like, I feel like I should be judging it on. And then the more distance I got from the movie, I was like, this, that movie was great. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, right. And then I watched it again uh, with friends. I showed it to people. And uh, the entire time I watched it through the second time, it was just, I really did enjoy it. Mm. Um, but the first time I watched it, uh, and I think if you stopped, like, halfway through the movie, I might have said, that was good. I enjoyed that. And then it... T- <laughs> It's, it's, it starts weird and yeah. it continues to be weird and it takes a bunch of turns into weird. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. but it's, and it, it never feels like it betrays its original, well, like concept. Oh, no, no, no. Absolutely not. I, cause my experience was very similar to yours, only I never went back to rewatch it. Yeah. Just cause I, I have very little time to do what, rewatch it. It's media. really good. But, what was so surprising was for how surreal it was to start. Like it was just, it had, it was just a little bit bizarre anyways. Yeah. That it was so surprising when it took these other turns, especially near the end that I could not have seen coming. And I was recommending it to a friend and uh, they were like, should I watch the trailer? And then I looked up the trailer on YouTube Yeah. and I watched like the first two thirds of it. And then in the last third of it, I realized that it was, kind of spoiling moments from the movie. Right. Um, and I was like, wow. So, like, if you watch... If you want... If this sounds appealing to you, watch the trailer and watch, like, the first minute of the trailer. Watch until you've decided that it is either for you or not for you. And the first moment that you decide it seems like something you want to watch, cl- like, stop watching it. Right. Um, and, like, it, yeah, because it, it... Okay, so we'll say something that's not a spoiler. It's in the trailer. And it happens very early, which is... There's the idea of... Um, a white voice in this. Right. Um, and literally, for it, so it's, you know, uh, black cast, or, you know, at least the, the main actor is black, but it's a, it's a d- relatively uh, diverse cast. Um, and his voice, when he uses his white voice, isn't him affecting a different tone. It is a white actor, David Cross, dubbed over him. Oh, that's Tobias. Yeah, Funke. Tobias Yunke yeah. from um, Arrested, Arrested Development. Development. And just, you know, like, it's comedian David Cross. And it's dubbed over, and it's not even, like, like 100% perfectly dubbed over. Like, it's, it is, it is like, it's lip-synced, but it's, like, it's not meant to be seamless. Because all of a sudden, he starts talking what is clearly somebody else's voice. Right. And that's the kind of weird that the movie is. And it... I think part of why it might seem so strange when they when they make more weird stuff happen is that the f- the initial weirdness like that feels like an artistic and aesthetic choice. Right. And then I think the deeper you get into the movie, the more you understand that the weirdness isn't just an aesthetic choice, that it's baked into the bones of the storytelling. And yeah. it is like there's a lot of individual bits of weirdness that they could take out. Right. But the overall weirdness is so core to what the thing is that I think it's less that you're like, wow, I wasn't expecting this movie to be weird. You're like, wow, I wasn't expecting the weirdness to end up being like the plot points for the back <laughs> half of the movie. And you're like, I, I yeah. wasn't I, like, I, I thought that it was just going to be like dubbed over and it was just going to be like, oh, OK, so it's just, you know, that bit of like cool yeah. sort of fresh storytelling. Yeah. And I wasn't expecting it to like. I wasn't expecting the weirdness to, like, bubble up from underneath, like, the cracks in the earth of this story and really right. just, like, be so fundamental. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a great movie, though. Okay. So good. good. I, I didn't think... I, I, I didn't think I disliked it, but I wasn't confident that I liked it when I first saw it, and I love it so mm. much now. Mm. And I, I love... I love it for just thinking about it. Like, I don't even need to watch it a third time for me to like it more than I did the second time I watched it. Right. It... <laughs> It's aged like a fine wine, just in my head, <laughs> which is an unusual experience for media watching for me. That's cool. It doesn't normally happen. That's a pretty uh, strong endorsement. It is. It's a really good movie. Yeah. It does a lot of stuff. Boots okay. Riley, the director, yeah. I 
like he's the kind of person that I've like I looked up and I was like okay what else is he doing because like I wanna if this is like an early thing right if this is like if this is like one of his first like breakout things and he's gonna continue to have his same voice and vision but with like hopefully more resources I would love to see whatever you know this guy makes right right yeah cool yeah, so there we go. Did we Get, save enough time for questions? I think so. <laughs> we got some time for questions. Okay, so our first question comes from Care. And they say, after completing the exer- expert mode level of the Batman Ninja Batman challenge, I noticed that you can get the hooded cloak gear from completing Nightmare. And I did just for the gear as opposed to resetting. Basically, my question is, can you get Clark Kent's classes in a similar fashion from a certain challenge or any way other than spending cash? Uh, the The short answer is... I'm not 100% sure. The longer answer is probably. There's a lot of the challenges where the... Well, not a lot of the challenges. All the challenges, you get the signature gear for the that particular character. Yeah. Uh, no, no matter what the skin is. So for some of the, the newer characters, like all the Dawn of Justice uh, challenges... Uh, when I say all, the two out of the three Dawn of Justice challenges, mm-hmm. you can get the, the Dawn of Justice signature gears. And I think you can also do that I'm not 100% sure on some of the others. The problem is you have to get through Nightmare, and that's not as much of a consideration for most, for a lot of players that are relatively new. Mm-hmm. If you've got, um, if you've got the wherewithal and the ability to it, just hit Nightmare and you'll, or at least do Expert, and then you'll be able to see what Nightmare is, and then it'll tell you what the gear is that you can get. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely worth doing. So every t- next time there's a Superman challenge, whichever Superman version you've got, which is New 52. Oh, this laundry's ready. Uh, New 52 <laughs> Superman or Dawn of Justice uh, Superman, or I think maybe even Injustice 2 Superman. Definitely there's a possibility. There's so many Superman skins that are challenges. Yeah. Yeah. We really thought the Internet of Things, like, as a society, we thought the Internet of Things was going to be big, big. Yeah. And I think it almost feels this topic, even though it's just, a, it's just a, like, a thing that makes life easier yeah. to get a notification on your phone when your laundry is done. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, it almost feels bad in a way that I have trouble <laughs> articulating. Um, anyways, our next question comes from Son Gaku. And they say, I just got the Tantu Totem for the first time and the hype was real. It makes everything so much easier. That said, when you were discussing how powerful Regime Superman was before his nerf due to the unblockable special 2, was there ever a time where both Totem and pre-nerf Superman coexisted, or was he nerfed way before Totem was released? I can only imagine how broken he would be with Totem and Death Cart on the latter. Something else that I noticed is that the most fun I have with the game is when playing with Elite 10 Silver characters and Elite 2 to 3 Gold characters since their power levels are around the same. Cards like Regime Flash and Lantern can really make any gold card become viable for play since a lot of characters suffer from poor speed, like the Bane cards, Grundy, Killer Croc, Scorpion, and Doomsday. I know Batman Prime buffs attack, but would it have been too powerful to make a gold card that also buffs speed and energy acceleration for the whole team regardless of the type of card they are, or would having an entire Elite 10 gold team being 15% faster and having 25% more energy acceleration without gear be balanced? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, and this it's, is a good question. It's a, it's a really good insight on onto the mechanics into the mechanics of the game. I didn't feel this way originally, but speed is definitely underrated. It's what makes Solomon Grundy bad, and it what's it's what makes Reverse Flash so good. So out of all the flashes, actually, that was one of the the parts of Reverse Flash that we were able to exploit and finished Survivor with when we did our Survivor video because Mm -hmm. with his speed boost, he was fast enough to do that juggle. And Solomon Grundy is so slow that if you give him a speed boost, he becomes workable and then you can take advantage of boss Solomon Grundy's or more likely Earth 2 Solomon Grundy's um, passive and Mm -hmm. his stats. Um, But in between, there are a lot of characters where the speed doesn't make a difference. And I think that's part of the problem because you need to have either a really good fast character like reverse flash or a really awful character who without speed is just almost to me it feels like it's not playable Mm -hmm. um and so the great thing about speed though and why it's a little bit underrated is because it's not factored into matchmaking so when you're playing multiplayer against other teams Mm -hmm. uh then that's again also why power generation is so important right um you look at Regime Green Lantern, he's got a, a posted ability of, what, 25% power gen boost? It feels like a lot more, and it seems like it makes all the difference in the world, especially in a in a post-Tantu uh, Totem world where specials are it. 
Mm -hmm. Like you get to special so much faster, then you want to make sure that you've got a team that's able to take advantage of that. Yeah. Um, And I'm trying to think. So um, everything that doesn't, like crit chance boost when you use augmentations or crit damage boost, also things that aren't taken into account in matchmaking. Yeah. So they feel like they have an outsized kind of impact on the game because... Because there are basically the only things that actually have an impact on how easy a multiplayer fight is. The other things right. have an impact on uh, how hard it is, actually, because you're potentially getting harder gear, more astral harness, right? right? And the right. only advantage they give you is uh, battle points, which is not a gameplay benefit. Right. And hidden stats are the only thing that can give you... Hidden stats and gear are the only thing that can give you a gameplay benefit in multiplayer to yeah. make the fights easier. Yeah. Now that I, now that it came out of my m- mouth, I, I had the thought, it seemed like the right thing, and I've actually just said it, and it's, it's actually wrong. Raging Green Lanterns actually become less important in post Tantu Totem world than a world where you actually have it, because you can get the power faster than you can with power generation. Yeah. He was, specials have always been important, and Raging Green Lantern has always been great on teams, but once you've got Tantu Totem, he matters a lot less. Yeah, because you can set up basically a character to get free power and to only need to generate power if you're using it at maximum effectiveness once right yeah and once you have that power once you don't lose it and you just get basically powered up you get the ability to use specials and none of the cost of using specials yeah because if you set up your team right you are doing a lot of specials and you don't have to do the work of generating power like you're watching deathstroke right now right you don't have to generate power one little hit at a time yeah yeah um, so stuff that is accounted for matchmaking, like attack and health, they don't help as much because you boost your damage, your opponents get harder. Yeah. You boost your health, your opponents get harder. Although there are ways to smuggle in extra attack and health. Right. So um, it's anything health. conditional. Right. Um, so hidden health characters like uh, Containment Doomsday, where they have to get knocked out first and then yeah. they revive and they get more health. Uh, Blackest Night Hawk Girl, who gives the teams revives. Mm-hmm. Or if you've got sort of limited damage where it's not broad based in everything. Mm-hmm. So if you only boost basic damage, like, or like red special two damage. Or you, yeah, or special two damage or special one damage or whatever. If it's only mm-hmm. special damage or if it's only basic damage, doesn't count. Or if it's conditional, like somebody like Boss Hall and Grundy. Right, where it's not there all the time, but it's at a certain point of his health. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, those are Anything that's not constant and universal. So, if it doesn't apply all the time, and right. it doesn't apply to all the types of damage, then you get to bring it in. Yeah. And it's secret. I, I, I agree with um, Sun Gaku that um, it would actually be really cool to have a, a some gold cards with some of the silver passives. Yeah. It, it would definitely make the teams more interesting, but I think maybe even a better thing to think about is or not to think about is that when you get to the level where you're playing, where you're not desperate to get the rewards every time, yeah, then you, you're free to play those teams because the amount of battle points won't matter. It's, it's just playing with the cards that you like Mm -hmm. with the strategy that you want to, to use. It's as close to just pure sandbox fun. Yeah. So the problem really is that once you get to that point, if you've elited, if you've promoted your golds too high, you don't get the chance. Mm -hmm. You've got the imbalance team. And it's some unbalanced teams work, and as long as you're okay with sometimes losing, if your main damage dealer gets knocked out, then you're gonna be okay. Yeah, yeah. So there we go. Uh, our next and final question comes from R E L, fourteen uh, N, and they say, or it's R sorry R three L fourteen N, and they say, loving the video. Go- Videos, guys. I just got back into this game a few weeks ago and did a fresh start for the kick of it. These kinds of vids really help new and old players like me get back into the flow of things. That being said, I wanted to ask what your guys' recommendations are when it comes to spending all the different currencies, credits, nth metal, etc., and what are the best things to get, booster packs, gears, etc. I know you probably have answered this question in the past, but I just wanted to know for future reference. Keep up the great work, my dudes. So I have two things to say. Mm. Uh, First off, great comment. Second off, before I forget... Um, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Sorry to bother you. It was on Canadian Netflix recently. I, I saw oh, that just recently. Okay. So I don't know if you're outside of Canada, but if you're <laughs> looking okay. to hear it, I wanted to mention it. Right. Um, that if you're in Canada or if you can have a VPN to Canada, I know it's at least on some Netflixes. Right. Uh, which makes it a lot easier ne- to access. Is it Netflixes or Netflixes? I don't know. But anyways, that's that's all I want to say. Well, I just wanted to mention okay, it very right. quickly. We don't need to keep talking about it. I know I've okay. talked enough about it, but, but you can watch the it. The plural of matrix is matrices. Yeah. So is the plural of Netflix Netflixes? Probably not. It probably is not. Maybe grammatically, technically. That's the thing about 
I love language. Grammar is that there's a lot of things that we do that's wrong. Grammar and language. We, right. we say a lot of stuff that is objectively wrong based off of rules. But the rules are just things that somebody made up a long time ago. And if it sounds right to us, and if a bunch of people are saying it wrong, then it's right in the way that matters. And if most people are doing it wrong, then that's just what becomes the new rule. Well, yeah, because it, it, it's funny how English, at least, has sort of oscillated between being pres- prescriptive and descriptive. Yeah. Where, you know, there was hundreds of years where spelling was non-standardized. And then when you tried to make it more consistent so that yeah. it would be clearer when people were communicating what they wanted to express, that it became prescriptive. Yeah. And then it still wants to be its own thing still. So when stuff happens and a lot enough people do it, it also becomes the right thing to do. Yeah, there, there's really only two facets of language correctness, which is do other people understand what you mean and how many other people are doing things the same way that you are. Yeah. And there might be a way that's technically wrong by somebody's definition, right. but if there's enough people who are doing it the way you are, then it's not wrong. And even if nobody else is doing it the way that you are, if you're understood, it's also still not really wrong. Right. Right. It right. might not... D- you know, depending on tone and a bunch of other more complicated stuff, it might not be the most appropriate uh, use of language, but it's still not, like, wrong. It's hard for right. somebody to say something that's wrong. It's really just maybe not understood or not commonly done in that way. Right. But that's, I guess, sort of by definition what are, the wrongness would be with um, getting language, grammar, spelling, whatever wrong. Yeah, if you're going to be a jerk about it. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Um, so let's answer <laughs> yeah. the question. How to spend uh, the different currencies and what's the most important thing to buy? All right. Uh, credits, I think, unlocking the special... I mean, we're talking really early, and this is a consideration that's probably passed. I, all right, so the game's done. We might have to stick up some extra footage to um, yeah. finish this out. But so for credits, early on, unlocking, unlocking specials. specials. For sure. Yeah. Um, if, especially if it's characters you're going to keep on playing. And upgrading them, too. Yes, um, but unlocking, unlocking gear the most slots, uh, then getting gear lockers and promoting gears. And then it becomes a question or before it, it, the way the game used to be, it used to be the, the discount gold packs was the way. Yeah. And then specialty packs. Right. So when there were team packs, but all those team packs now have gone to the dark side and they cost real money. Mm-hmm. So I think y- there's a good argument to be made for challenge packs because they finally, a couple of years ago, updated the challenge packs. You've got a lot of good, strong cards that you can get out of it. And it's probably worth that extra. It, it wasn't worth twice the discount gold pack, but because the discount gold pack is gone for credits and it's now only real money, mm-hmm. um, then it's probably worth the 150,000 credits compared to the 100,000 credits. Yeah. Uh, nth metal, nth metal packs. That's relatively straightforward. It, you buy the 400 uh, nth metal packs if you want just metals you buy the 800 one if you could use any good cards the chance of metal is a little bit lower but the sort of backup golds that you can get are better than the 400 pack mm-hmm. and i think i could be wrong about this but i think the gear might be marginally better too and two the 200 pack if you only want the golds and you're willing to put in the time to use the airplane mode uh slash refund glitch airplane slash Airplane slash refund mode, airplane mode slash refund glitch. I'm getting all the words mixed up. It's yeah. like when we had the letters, all those letters to our Q and A, and and we got them all jumbled. P and Q and C and A and T. Yeah. Um, and Alliance credits. I think the support cards to boost the energy generation to play more often. That probably has way more value. But in general, the ones to give you the uh, attack boost and the health boost, I think they're okay. I think in the again in the world where you're worried about uh, sort of over promoting your cards so that you end up facing cards that, uh, opponents that are too difficult then they become that becomes less important yeah but definitely the uh the energy uh boosting energy generation boosting mm-hmm. cards and i think the last thing i'll put here which you don't uh have here because it's almost like a secondary currency i'd say shards uh cheap gear first in order, you start with the cheap gear because you're going to get your money back on it and then you work your way yeah. up to the more expensive gear uh, that's going to be the stuff that you actually use more long term. But yeah. It might not feel like that when you're starting out and you're just spending a lot of credits and shards on the weaker gear, but it pays off. If you if you continue playing, it pays off a lot yeah. and it slows you down right at the beginning, but then your ability to 
accumulate more shards and promote more gears really accelerates. I think at the beginning, because you're upgrading it faster, it actually speeds you up at the beginning, slows you down a little bit in the middle. That's when you, true. When you've spent yeah. stuff and you're on sort of that mid-tier gear. But there's... Yeah. It, it's it's good right at the start, it's a little bit slower in the middle, and then it's way better in the long term. True. So yep. there we yep. go. There, that's it. Yeah, and that's all of our questions this week. So, to finish up here, we have some people to thank. I'd like to give a shout out to Eliza. I'm late to my meeting, Katen. She fell asleep and woke up at 8pm, thinking it was 8am of the next day, and had to hurry to get ready for a meeting that was almost 12 hours away oh, that she that's thought hilarious. she was late for. Oh, that's, that's hilarious. Yeah. I don't think I've ever done that. She she woke up, she was like, oh my gosh, she had to like get dressed and everything for like a meeting, and I was like, why am I the only one in this Zoom room for the scheduled <laughs> meeting? Oh, I feel bad for her, but that's too funny. Yeah. Uh, this shout out was brought to you by the illusion of time. Right. There we go. And the we fourth also, dimension. yeah, we also have some thank yous to give to all of the lovely folks who support us on Patreon. Yeah. That would be console peasant and Ed wound at the top tier. Last word, uh, Muhammad Al Shady at the, your message here tier, Sean Farrell, Daniel Simonson, Aaron Mall, Michael DeVries, Brandon C, Irvin Ruiz, and Eddie Dew at the credited level. And Chris Wolf, Scarlet Danny, Awesome Gamer Two for One, Pavu RS, Gavin Malot, and Isfar E at the gratitude level. There we go. Thanks so much for your support. Thanks so much to all of you for watching or listening. We'll see you next time. Komoda. Komoda.